<clears throat> well, it is uh, Palm Sunday, as has already been mentioned, as you see from uh, some of the special uh, decorations that we have up front and uh, our PowerPoint. So um, I, I always have loved Palm Sunday. I always loved as a kid getting to march into the church uh, with palm branches, which is something that, that our church did every Palm Sunday. Um, it's, uh, it commemorates Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem one week before uh, what appeared uh, to be defeat on the cross, but was in fact a great victory. Um, it was the arrival of a king. Um, really, that's how the people received him. Um, his whole life and his mission had been building to this moment. Um, we're not preaching uh, about Palm Sunday today, but we are recognizing it. It's an important day in the life of the church. Uh, but I, I think you'll see how today's passage does connect ultimately to Palm Sunday and, and fully to Easter. Uh, we've been hopping around the Gospels in this series on uh, the miracles of Jesus, encountering Jesus through his miraculous works. And I kind of wonder, how, how has it been for you who have been um, going through this with us? What has it been like to and a visit touched down in these various places where we see uh, Jesus uh, demonstrating his power and his compassion and his mercy and uh, in various ways. Uh, I wonder if you've encountered Jesus in any new ways through this series. Have you been just impressed by his incredible power? Or have you been more impressed with the intentionality and the special way and timing with which he has demonstrated that power, his, his presence and, and just availability to the people that he was ministering to. Um, I, I hope you have been touched in a special way through a lot of these messages. Today we're going to be touching down in the book of Luke. And uh, we've been in various books. We've kind of avoided Mark because we recently had a series in Mark. So we've been in Matthew, Luke, and John. Today we're in uh, Luke, and we're going to be in chapter 13 and 14, looking at two different uh, miracles. We're touching down right in the middle of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, his journey to the cross, and that extends from the end of chapter 9 all the way to chapter 19 in Luke. Um, this is called Luke's travel log. And uh, it's often called that, which it, as I said, it begins in 951, where Jesus, it says in that verse that he set his face toward Jerusalem. He began that journey and resolutely he set his face toward Jerusalem to fulfill his mission. And then it extends all the way to 19. The travel log is known uh, really in Luke for containing a whole lot of parables. Like if you, if you want to look at some parables, go to the travel log. Uh, but it also it contains a lot of other teachings and, um, and a lot of miraculous encounters with people along the way. And these miracles are not just bells and whistles. They're not just Jesus being a, a flashy kind of miracle worker. Um, it is, uh, we are encountering Jesus in his miracles and in a way that's more than just hocus pocus, okay? It is an encounter with a whole, the Holy One of Israel. That is what these miracles show us about Jesus. Now, um, I think it's worth mentioning, and I'll show you a uh, graph. You don't need to be able to read that. It's more just a visual. But the travel log of Luke is organized in what... Um, in kind of methods of Bible interpretation, we call a chiastic structure. It's a, it was a Hebrew way of writing. And a lot of your Bible was organized this way. It's, it's not very obvious to us, but it's a chiastic structure. And what we sometimes call it is a, a funnel of significance. And so the events of Jesus' life, his teachings in this section of Luke are organized in a kind of an ascending or in significance, an ascending and descending way. And in fact, the, the passages and whether it's their subject matter or the type of person Jesus is encountering, they echo back and this doesn't work on a screen, but they echo back and forth. So um, essentially, there is a central focal point to the whole unit. 
And whatever falls kind of on the uphill side leading to that center point has a corresponding passage on the downhill side of that center point. And all of this begs the question, what's the focal point? What is the, what is the funnel of significance lead down to? And more importantly, why am I rambling on about all this? <laughs> the center point is found at the end, the second half of Luke 13. And what the, these few passages, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the uh, leaven, the kingdom of God is like leaven that, that spreads throughout the whole lump, and, uh, and then the narrow door passage, and then his lament over Jerusalem, all of this in this central passage is about how the kingdom is coming, how it comes, and who will be welcomed into the kingdom. How it comes and who's going to be there. In this center point between the, this, this center point of the travel log in this chiastic structure, I can show you kind of, now we can zoom in on the center point. On either side of that center point, there are the two miracles that we are going to be looking at today. Um, and these, the center point between these miracles exposes the surprising revelation that there are many who would suppose that they would be included in God's kingdom. They're really sure of it because they look at their track record and they're, 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 they're sure that they would be included in God's kingdom. They are synagogue rulers. They are experts in the law. They are Pharisees. However, these spiritual elites, these luminaries, these spiritual guides, we might call them blind guides, they are going to be sorely disappointed because the things that they thought God cared most about, namely their religious track record, are in fact causing them to miss what in the center section Jesus calls the narrow door. Meanwhile, there are many misfits and outsiders who are coming into God's kingdom from the east and the west, that passage says, which is really good news for misfits and outsiders like you and I. The fact that so many Jews are resistant to the coming kingdom is heartbreaking to Jesus, and he expresses that heartbreak through his famous lament over Jerusalem, where he says at uh, the end of 13, 34 and 35, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those, who are sent to, stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is, this is kind of signifying this uh, temporary rejection of uh, the central role that, that Israel is playing in his salvation plan. They're not, there's no hope. It's not that there's no hope for them. They're, they can be included as well through Christ. But there is a, a major shift that's happening in his salvation plan. And uh, that center section points to it, but today's miracles, the two miracles, come at the beginning and end of this climactic passage, which is designed to confront spiritual pride, the spiritual pride of those who think that their religious performance for God is what really counts. And I say spiritual pride because the essence of spiritual pride is believing that you've got it right and everyone else has it wrong. You feel a sense of superiority for being on the inside, which makes you lack compassion for those who you perceive because of their track record as being on the outside. In fact, you need people to be wrong so that you can be so right. That is spiritual pride. And our miracles today are both Sabbath miracles. They take place on the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was a day that was ready-made for exposing people who have spiritual pride. That's why it falls before and after this central section. Because Sabbath keepers, you see, are, are they're spiritual insiders. They, uh, therefore, if you wanted to label someone as a misfit, 
and an outsider, all you had to do was show that they weren't keeping the Sabbath. The spiritual leaders of Jesus' time, uh, by this time, they had weaponized the Sabbath day through many man-made regulations that really fenced in how that day was to be kept. All of these rules were used to identify and condemn spiritual failures. Spiritual failures who just couldn't keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath, however, was intended by God as a day to cease from our labor. Sabbath, just the Shabbat, that word basically just means cessation, stopping, stopping from your labor. As the Lord of the Sabbath, in Mark uh, 2, I believe it is, Jesus clearly shows that he understood this purpose because as we observe him on the Sabbath, he loved even to do good works on the Sabbath. It was one of his favorite days to exhibit love and compassion and mercy toward broken and needy people. And by doing this, he reflects the true purpose of the Sabbath, a day of rest, of renewal, of worship. And he reflects the compassionate character of God who desires mercy over sacrifice and compassion over simple ritual obedience. Now, in these two Sabbath healings, which eventually we're going to get around to looking at, um, they're all the, we're about to read them, and Jesus' priorities will stand in contrast to the priorities of the religious leaders, the religious insiders like synagogue big shots and Torah know-it-alls. Okay, so let's go ahead and read through both of these miracles. In Luke 13, 10 to 17, the first one, and Luke 14, 1 to 6. You should find a pew Bible near you or pull it up on your phone, follow along. In Luke 13, 10, beginning in verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which, which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath day untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. And then there are the two central passages, but we skip down to Luke 14, 1 to 6. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of the ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on the Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. These two um, Sabbath healings are quite similar, aren't they? You see how they echo one another. They're actually called mirror healings. Both take place on the Sabbath day. Both pit Jesus against the religious leaders who felt threatened by him. Both showcase Jesus' power and compassion while exposing the religious pride and hard-heartedness hard, hard of the religious leaders. In both, Jesus rebukes their cold-hearted religiosity 
by suggesting that they care more about the welfare of animals, like oxen, than they do about a person who is suffering this physical disability. Jesus loved pushing people's buttons. And apparently there is no bigger button that can be pushed than the Sabbath button. Now Jesus is pressing the issue because like a vine dresser walking through his vineyards, he wants to see if there are any, if there's any fruit on the vines. And I think he's going to find that, unfortunately, there's not. So there's a disabled woman walking through this first passage now, beginning in verse 10. Verse 10 simply sets the stage. Um, he was teaching in a synagogue, and it happened to be the Sabbath. In verse 11, Luke, who is our narrator, retelling this story to us, he says, Behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. Luke always uses this word, behold, to create surprise. And in fact, it invites us to create a mental image of this poor woman in our mind's eye. Because we're being invited to see her. Because in this crowd, she was invisible. She was in the back. She was in the shadows. She was on the perimeter. She was invisible to everyone but Jesus and now us. She had a physical disability, but in fact, we're told that her primary problem is spiritual in nature. There is a spiritual cause behind this physical disability. Spiritual oppression in some way had eventually led to her being bent over double, contorted by the destructive work of the enemy, her spiritual enemy. This mention of 18 years, it really is meant to heighten our awareness of her immense suffering. I mean, could you just imagine 18 years of this kind of oppression? I, I thought of this is being like, just imagine an 18-year-old. I'm sure we all know someone who's 18. Any of you young folks, 18? Close to 18? Well, we all know an 18-year-old. That person's lifespan is how long this woman has been suffering from this condition. Her description reminds me, um, in fact, of a woman that I, I would often see walking through the streets of Kanye Shemer. She was literally bent over double by her disability, and I'd, I don't know what kind it was. I usually saw her from the car. I never really had a chance to interact with her. She seemed to have some kind of neurological condition that caused her to move in very erratic ways, and her face was often contorted in grotesque ways that I'm sure just made people who passed her recoil and, and, and just not know what to do when around her. And I often wondered if she might have been afflicted by a similar kind of condition. There's only one word that is appropriate to describe what both of these women were facing, and that's bondage. She was a prisoner in her own body. And sadly, this woman that I've seen, um, I haven't seen her since, and um, I fear that she may have succumbed to that condition or may have to be in a hospital now. In verse 12, we notice that Jesus sees her, calls her, speaks to her, this woman in the synagogue. And she would not have been on the front row, as I mentioned, as a woman. It's actually quite shocking, given her condition, that she's even there in the first place. And Jesus doesn't in this instance, he does in other miracles, but he does not evaluate her faith. He's acting on his own compassionate initiative. He sees her need and he chooses in that moment to pronounce her, just right away, pronounce her liberated from her disability. Now, I think it bears uh, worth mentioning that this word disability could be just translated ailment, um, kind of means uh, the opposite of physical strength, the, the, health, the strength of health. It's, 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 very, it's used elsewhere in your Bible. It's used in the passage where Paul recommends that Timothy take a little wine for his ail, frequent ailments as a remedy. 
So not all ailments are cured, uh, it would seem. Not, ail not all ailments um, are necess necessitate the kind of spiritual intervention that Jesus is using here. I mean, some can be cured by natural remedies. Paul also commends the Galatians in Galatians 4 and how they received him despite his ailment, which was a trial to them. It was a burden to them because he had a physical weakness, a physical ailment, which he boasts of. But Paul was not freed from his ailment. And I, I mention all of this to remind us that while God is compassionate, that he's willing and he's able to heal, he wants to renew all things and he will in the end. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes, as it was with Paul, he does not remove that physical ailment. And most often, it's not spiritual in nature, though it can be. So, all that to say, we shouldn't jump to conclusions about people we know that are dealing with these ailments. In verse 13, after pronouncing her free, Jesus crosses the synagogue chamber and places his hands on her. He extends his hands, and it would seem that this was probably to actually physically straighten her up. Because the text says that immediately she was made straight. And it's a passive verb indicating that it happened to her from an outside source. So Jesus probably crossed over and lifted her up. For 18 years she has been bent over. People in this town, wherever it was, would have known her, would have seen her walking the streets. Now she's standing upright. They can finally see her face directly, appropriately. I don't, you sometimes you study the Bible, you reflect on what it would have been like. You put yourself there. And I can just imagine that there were some outstanding sounds that accompanied this woman in her chiropractic adjustment. <laughs> Probably much like if you took a pack of spaghetti and twisted it, or you would, sometimes we get bubble wrap and lay it on the floor, and we let our kids ride their scooters and skateboards over it. And I imagine it sounded a lot like that. After this sound, there was surely also, you would have heard, a gasp from the crowd and an exhale of relief from this woman followed by her resounding hallelujah as she, as the text says, gave glory to God. Can you imagine anyone in this moment not being relieved on her behalf, not being Relieved at the sight of this woman being straightened up. I mean, I love seeing people getting their back adjusted. And this was an incredible sight. But however, in verse 14, there was one present who was not so pleased. He was the synagogue ruler, the archis synagogus, the arch synagogus. He was the synagogue ruler. He was the guy in charge. He was the most significant elder on site and responsible for everything that happened there. And he was fuming mad. They probably wanted to grab Jesus by the collar and drag him out of there. But in this honor and shame based culture, he couldn't do that. And so he addresses the crowd. He, he can't challenge Jesus directly. So he confronts the crowd and ultimately he shames the woman indirectly for just coming to Jesus. He accuses her of seeking this healing on the Sabbath day, but there's really nothing in the text that indicates that she even did that. She was just there. Jesus took the initiative. His word choice is ironic. He says there are six days in which to work, in which work ought to be done. We're looking at what should be done here and when it should be done. And Jesus has just done a wonderful work of mercy and compassion. So are you seriously suggesting that, that this kind of work is forbidden on any of the days that God has created? It's, it's incredible that he would suggest such a thing. This official is applying Deuteronomy 5, 12 to 15 in a very strict way. And I just want to read it because it's significant, um, some of the connections to our passage. 
It says, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant. So we're talking about everybody here, and including your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. Did you notice that? That built into the Sabbath regulation, there's even compassion and justice for those who didn't have the same kind of rights as the general population. It Now, it builds on that with the next verse, which is very important. It's a very important reminder to the people of Israel. You shall remember that you were a slave in bondage in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day started with a connection to creation, But once Jesus is liberated from Egypt, from their bondage, the way that they apply the Sabbath, even to male and female servants, is connected to their own liberation from bondage. We need to key in on that language there at the end. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, the Lord your God brought them out of their bondage. Isn't it tragic that built into this law was a reminder that the Lord had liberated them from their slavery. And somehow, this synagogue official thought this poor woman should stay in her bondage, both physical and spiritual bondage, just a little bit longer. Apparently, the Sabbath wasn't a suitable day, in his mind, for liberation. In verse 15, Jesus whom Luke, as our narrator, you'll pay attention to that verse, he's quite intentional to refer to Jesus as Lord. He has a rebuke of his own for the synagogue ruler. But not him alone, because Jesus uses the plural here, and he says, you hypocrites, indicating that the hard-heartedness, the lack of compassion, the spiritual pride of this leader is not an isolated, it's not isolated to him. It's not an anomaly. It was endemic to all of the Jews at this time. And and this is actually the point. This is why Jesus is so intentional to act and show mercy and compassion and power on the Sabbath day. And this is why Luke places these Sabbath healings before and after his words about who's really on their way into the kingdom. It won't come through resting on the Sabbath. It will come through the one who brings Sabbath rest. Now, rabbinic rules at this time, they had 39 different rules, or excuse me, they they forbid 39 forms of labor on the Sabbath day. But even in the synagogue ruler's school of thought, there were provisions made for leading an animal to water. Essentially, it was reasonable for an animal's basic needs to be met. And Jesus is aware that there were provisions made for animals, so he rebukes them for prioritizing an animal over this woman. And so in verses 16 and 17, Jesus points to the shamefulness of their position. They have failed to recognize the inherent worth of this woman in God's sight. And Jesus calls her To emphasize that, he calls her a daughter of Abraham as a member of a spiritual family who were, if you remember the Abrahamic covenant, they were supposed to be blessed. Being a child of Abraham was supposed to lead to blessing, yet they would deprive her of that blessing. They would deprive her of the promise And finally, he emphasizes the moral rightness of her being set free from 18 years of bondage on a day that was meant to remind them of how they were liberated from their bondage in Egypt. Now, in Jesus' mind, she has suffered far too long. She's part of the spiritual family. And the Sabbath was always about rest and freedom. 
not oppression and bondage. There are two voices that ring out in the synagogue that day, Jesus's and the synagogue rulers. And public opinion sides with Jesus because this thing that Jesus has done is clearly a cause for rejoicing. And it was determined by the crowd to be a glorious thing. Now this parable flows right into the central passage of Luke's travel log, which again reminds us, deals with how the kingdom is coming and the shocking revelation about who would be included, who would actually make it in. And this first Sabbath miracle has revealed the, the spiritual pride that is preventing many religious insiders from embracing Jesus and his kingdom. The, their issue is spiritual pride. They've got it right. Everyone else has it wrong. And so as we wrap up today's passage, we're only briefly going to be looking at the second miracle because really there's a lot of parallels there. It functions to give the religious leaders now a second chance in a way. In Luke, in the central passage in Luke 13, 26, 27, Jesus says, Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he, meaning the Lord, will say, I tell you, I don't know where you come from. Depart from me, you workers of evil. This leads to our second Sabbath miracle in, in 14, 1 to 6. And in it, we see a, a ruler of the Pharisees this time, experts in the Torah also, and a gaggle of Pharisees themselves, eating with Jesus, eating in Jesus' presence. Jesus is eating in a house of this ruler of the Pharisees, just like in the passage that precedes it. Wouldn't you know it, there also happens to be a man there who Needs, he has a physical malady, a physical problem. It's called um, dropsy with, or hydropsy. Some, uh, there's various words to call it. Basically, it was um, an edema or a um, buildup of fluids, usually in the extremities of the bodies, the arms or the legs. Um, and, off, and really, it was probably a symptom of some other condition or health problem that he was dealing with. But in this passage, there's not really an indication that it's spiritual in nature. He just has a physical problem. Jesus uh, in, initiates a legal question about whether or not it's lawful to heal on the Sabbath. He's revisiting the issue with the same crowd. It's as if he's giving them a second chance and an opportunity to Choose compassion over their spiritual pride. And so, what response do they have to that legal question? They, they, they have no response. It's too costly to them to lose the Sabbath as a means of measuring themselves against other people. So after Jesus heals the man and sends him away in a very succinct way, he turns to the leaders with the question, which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on the Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? Still nothing but silence from them. They still have nothing to say. All Jesus is expressing here is the simple principle that love expressed in mercy and compassion never takes a day off. But they must resist Jesus and his work because otherwise they would lose one of the primary ways that they can categorize people into spiritual haves and have-nots. They have missed the true gift that the Sabbath brings. It was given to mankind as a weekly occasion to enter into rest, just as God rested from his labor in creation. Because of their spiritual pride, these leaders are missing the bigger picture that's being unveiled before their eyes. That Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. He is, in fact, in this moment, bringing rest to the weary. He's showing that in part through these miracles and how on the Sabbath he is giving them rest and liberation and freedom from their bondage to their physical and even spiritual 
oppression. He's, all of this is revealing that if you have Jesus, if you are with Jesus, you have what the Sabbath promised. In Colossians, Paul calls the Sabbath a shadow of things to come. But he says the substance, the real thing, belongs to Christ, is wrapped up in who Christ is. The Sabbath was a shadow. Jesus is the real thing. Jesus brings now a greater Sabbath rest. He brings an eternal rest if we are willing to to find our rest in Him today. As we prepare ourselves for Easter, let us examine our approach to following the Lord. Are we growing in religious pride and religious performance, developing an us versus everybody else kind of mentality which closes our hearts to misfits and outsiders because of how we're measuring ourselves? Or are we willing to encounter in a new way, a new way of finding our rest? Are we willing to encounter Jesus who demonstrated that he was so attuned to the heart of the Father and his character of compassion that he was always ready to love his neighbor and show compassion when confronted with need? That's what these miracles ultimately show us, is the kind of attitude and readiness that we can have when we have our rest in Jesus. We're just ready to respond to the need that is in front of us. We're not chasing some kind of qualification that could only be found by observing some man-made regulations. It's a beautiful picture of what the Sabbath promises and a beautiful picture of how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. I think it's a good way to prepare for Easter as we prepare this week in examining our lives, examining what's in our hearts, examining, um, just reflecting on, on what we have encountered as we have observed Jesus healing, showing power, showing mercy and compassion. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for this opportunity just to encounter Jesus um, in a renewed way. We thank you that you provide rest from our labor. That no longer do we need to succumb to the, the, the idea or the perspective that, that we need to chase our qualification before you, by obeying man-made regulations to, to build up a track record that makes us acceptable in your sight because you have liberated us from sin and death by the cross. We can now rest in you. Lord Jesus, you invited all who are weary to come to you and find their rest. You say in Hebrews that there remains a Sabbath rest for all of us. Lord, we pray that this week as we look forward to Easter, uh, that you would do a work in us to, to prepare us to receive that good news in a new way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.